Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such an informative and fun show for you this evening. Mike Bush is here, and uh, we are going to talk about getting stranded away from home, what to do, how to prepare for trips, all sorts of things to keep in mind as uh, you maybe come into the holiday season and decide it's time to do some trips and see some family. And so uh, Mike has some great, great advice. We're going to just have an open discussion here about it and should be absolutely wonderful. Before we get started, just a few things as always. We have so many amazing fall events that are showing up in Social Flight, so be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. You can see all the great fly-ins and pancake breakfasts and pumpkin drops and all these cool things that we're seeing happening all around the country to celebrate fall. It is just so cool. It's all free. It's here to support general aviation. Just check out socialflight.com. In addition, in Social Flight, we have our Fly to Win Challenge. All you need to do is get the app and just check in at at least one airport. Could be your home airport, and hopefully it's a bunch of airports as you fly around, and that Fly to Win Challenge has us giving away prizes. We just gave away an Aspen E5 system, and that is so cool to see that uh, as that panel comes together, it's going into the shop for that winner, that Social Flight member. We are giving away now a Lightspeed Zulu 3. There is still time to win that again. Just get the app, just check in, no cost, and uh, you could be our next winner. We are always giving things away here at Social Flight. And our last thing is to go check out Social Flight's FAA learning system. We have a partnership with the FAA that uh, provides for all of these wings and uh, AMT and IA renewal courses that are all available on demand through Social Flight. You simply watch the show on there, you take a quiz afterwards, and uh, you'll get, depending on the video, either Wings credit or uh, AMT credit if you're a mechanic. And if you're an IA, you can even go on there and get your eight hours of uh, continuing education if you're using that for renewal of your IA. The last thing that I would like to announce for this evening, very, very excited, just got back from MDAA, and uh, there's some videos out there on that. And in addition to that, I was able to spend some time with one of our wonderful new sponsors here at Social Flight, and that is U Avionics. They have come on board helping to keep all of this going and make it available to all of you. And uh, we're gonna have them uh, in a future episode here on the show to talk about their sky beacon, their sky sensor, some really, really cool products that they have that are also coming on the market. So be sure to check out U Avionics. And now I'd like to introduce tonight's guest, Mike Bush. Mike is arguably the best known AMP and IA in general aviation. He founded Savvy Aviation in 2008 to provide aircraft maintenance management and consulting services to thousands of aircraft owners, including pre-buy management, innovative engine monitor analysis, and 24-7 breakdown assistance. That's essentially AAA for general aviation. It's probably one of the things we're going to talk about, of course, tonight when it comes to getting stuck away from home. He has authored hundreds of articles and four books on aircraft ownership and maintenance. And tonight, He's here to talk about being stuck away from home. Let me bring him on the line now, as I am uh, so excited to have him join us here. Welcome to the show. Hey, Mike, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, but I have a question for you. Is it really legal to drop a pumpkin from an airplane? You know, that's what I thought. I think it has to be a pretty small pumpkin, or you... I, I'm seeing all of these pumpkin drops happening. Now, I've participated in flower drops, right, with like yeah. a little bag. And then yeah, I'm like, yeah. pumpkins? Like, how does that not even hurt the airplane if it's like, but there's pictures all over the internet of these events happening. They are oh, pretty my. small, right? Like the pumpkins are about this big. They have to fit out, fit through the storm window. <laughs> I guess so. That's what I'm thinking. It's like, how small is this pumpkin got to be? <laughs> not hit the horizontal stabilizer on the way down. Right. Oh, my goodness. The le- I remember like flying in a Grumman, you crack the canopy open, you put that little bag of flour and kind of scoot it off the wing walk. But yeah, pumpkins, I guess, I guess bigger pumpkins for high wings and little small baby pumpkins for. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I'm worried about the horizontal stabilizer. Is he bringing the airplane into the shop for a pumpkin strike? I mean, exactly. <laughs> oh man, do not do this when you're in close formation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no kidding, right? And I, I just, <laughs> I don't know uh, who, who, who can imagine? I, I guess you could see someone doing a big one if they like have a jump plane. Or maybe like you can do photo yeah, ship with a banana thing to pull the back doors on. Then you can push a real big pumpkin out. And I don't could, know if that helps the they target could put zone. Out, they could push out a pumpkin cluster if you had a jump plane. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good thing, everybody. Go check them out and send us yeah. pictures because some of it's, I mean, there's the coolest things happening this fall. I didn't mean to distract you, but I just never heard of a pumpkin drop before. And and that makes two of us, right? I've heard of pumpkin <laughs> chunking, but not not a drop. So you yeah. you are we are in this together, my friend. Um, so listen, you wrote a wonderful article in AOPA recently on maintenance away from home, and that's kind of uh, I want to expand on that. So for everyone out there, if you haven't already read it, go check it out and and read his article. But I want to kind of talk about the the storyline because a lot of people are perhaps considering long trips for the holiday season or for other things. Um, and, and a lot of people have questions about how, how do I prepare? What happens when I get stuck? So let's kind of take this in order here. Um, the first thing that comes up and I want to ask you about is preparation. And let's, let's think about it in terms of some people think about doing a bunch, doing, you know, maintenance to make sure everything's okay before going on a trip. What are your thoughts on, on things that you should make sure are in order with your plane before you go like 800 miles from home? Well, my first thought is don't do any maintenance on the airplane shortly before the departure. Uh, because anytime you do maintenance, there's always a possibility of, of breaking something. Um, and we don't want to launch off on a trip with, a, with maintenance-induced failure. So if, if, if you need to do something to prepare for the trip, you know, maybe an oil change or something, do it a few hours ahead of time. Get, get, a, little, get, get a little time on the airplane before you launch off onto a long trip because just to make sure that everything, everything is working fine. I, I get, even when I'm doing my own maintenance, I, I follow that rule because, you know, every, everybody makes mistakes. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, so many of the things that you've written about in your books and, and you've lectured on is maintenance-induced failure or early, you know, infant infancy failure when you put a new component on. So that yeah. that makes sense, you know. So so you're saying, you know, give it a, a, a number of hours or time beforehand so you have a lot of time on whatever things before you launch off on some trip. Yeah, you know me anyway. I'm a, I'm sort of a dyed-in-the-wool maintenance minimalist. Yes, you know, and, and proud of it. Um, uh, it so, so you know, a lot what? of people somehow think maintenance makes airplanes more reliable, but a lot of the time, a lot of times, it makes them less reliable. And so, so one thing you mentioned there that makes sense, right, is even with oil changes, does that mean that you would rather, let's say, that most people go 40, 50 hours, you'd rather people go. Uh, go some more hours above on their oil change rather than do an oil change just before they launch. Well, you know, the, the, the an oil change is not particularly invasive procedure. Um, so, you know, I would definitely want to have a couple of hours on the airplane after the oil change. The, the more invasive the procedure, the, the, the higher the risk of something going wrong, and so the more time you ought to you ought to leave on it. I would be very nervous about changing a cylinder or something right before going off. Oh, oh yeah, that makes sense. And and you know I've heard things like I've heard mechanics when when people have come to them and said, hey, I'm planning this long cross country, say things like, well, you know, we were gonna you know do your magnetos at the next annual. They've got a lot of hours on them. Maybe we should do those before the trip. That yeah, sounds that, like that's a red a perfect flag. Example of what you shouldn't do, right? Yeah. And and you mentioned that uh, oil changes aren't that invasive. I will say I I met up with uh, someone at an airport when we were traveling and was talking with them that had just gotten a uh, uh, a mall that's this gorgeous mall 
and um, they'd flown it cross country back after they went to pick it up. And the last thing that was done on it before they picked it up was an oil change. <laughs> and the first thing that happened to them midway on their trip back is the oil filter was loose and spraying oil yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the risk. It's funny you brought up the mag thing because because I, I had I, I violated my own rule. I, I had sent all four mags on my airplane out for 500 hour and not very long after that. Um, I, I had a, a commitment in, in Indiana. I flew my airplane from California to Indiana. And about, it, it, it made it all the way to Wichita without any problems, but on the last leg uh, from Wichita and Indiana, and about 20 minutes before I got to my destination, um, I got an engine monitor alarm, a high TIT alarm, and uh, about 30 seconds worth of troubleshooting and uh, it proved to me that one of the mags had gone completely dead. It, oh, wow. it, had, it had maybe six hours on it since the 500 hour. And it was a three day weekend and the, and the destination airport I learned had no maintenance at all on it. So it was interesting. I was able to, to get a mag overnighted in and I, uh, but just by the skin of my teeth because everybody was shutting down for this three-day weekend and um, I was able to pull together enough tools to, to to change out the mag on on the on the ramp there <laughs> wow but, uh, so I mean it was a perfect example of what you shouldn't do you know so when I give this advice it's from painful experience how did you pull enough tools? I can see enough tools together to mount a mag, but how did you pull enough tools together randomly to uh, time a mag? Well, I, I with the, the timing, uh, I had a, a friend who's an aircraft owner who is not a A and P, but but does a lot of his own work, and um, I, I asked him to put a bunch of tools. I gave him a list of tools I was going to need, including a, a a buzz box, and had him. Uh, drive down and, and, and help me out. And uh, I, I kind of cheated. I just timed the new mag to match up with the old mag. Rather than, you know, that's the probably incl- good enough. <laughs> the inclinometer stuff. I just wanted to get home. I mean, that's the key thing. But that anyway, makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. That's a perfect example of what you should not do is, is you know, any, any significant maintenance before you leave on a trip. So, so what about packing? Like what from, from, a, let's talk tools first, from a tool perspective, uh, is there, is, are there some things that, that you just think of at the top of your list that should always be available in case someone gets stuck, even if they're not personally qualified to do something that they may come across someone who, who maybe is able to help them. And at least you have some tools with you. Well, as a matter of fact, um, some years ago, <laughs> I wrote an article on this called the Traveling Toolkit uh, that that was published in the EAA Sport Aviation, and it's uh, it I've got it on the website. So if you Google Mike Bush Traveling Toolkit, I'm pretty sure you'll find it. Perfect. I, what I can't I can't remember whether toolkit was two words or one word, but so try it <laughs> both ways. But one way or the other, you'll find the article. Um. But, you, you know, you have to be very, very selective about tools because tools are heavy. And, uh, you know, the normal mechanics roll around tool cabinet probably weighs 800 pounds. So you, you have to be very careful about, you take just, you know, a, a very thoughtful minimum. Um, the most important tools to carry with you are, are ones that you're unlikely to be able to to score at the local Ace Hardware store wherever you're stuck, you know. So if, if you know if you if you didn't have a number two screwdriver, it wouldn't be the end of the world because you can always come up with one of those. But um, you, you might it might be harder to find safety wire pliers, for example, mm, or um, like a spark plug socket, like a deep spark plug. I socket. I, I um my my the airplane I fly now or have flown for the last. 30 some odd years um, has a habit of uh, of eating um, vacuum pumps and um, 
there are 1,000 series vacuum pumps because they operate the de-icing boot. So nobody stocks those vacuum pumps. And there's one of the there, there's one of the four nuts that secure the vacuum pump that is just about impossible to get at unless you have a special trick wrench, a vacuum pump wrench. The other three you can use you can get with a regular wrench. So I carry a vacuum pump wrench and I carry a spare vacuum pump. You know, uh, yep. it, it kind of varies from airplane to airplane. My uh, my first airplane was a Cessna 182. And it never seemed to have a problem with vacuum pumps, but it went through voltage regulators like crazy. And the, the second time I wound up sleeping on a hard wooden bench in, a, in an FBO because <laughs> my, my voltage regulator went out, I said, I'm never going to let this happen to me again. So I decided I would buy a spare voltage regulator and carry it in the airplane. And of course, you know, the rest of the story. Once I had the spare, I never had another <laughs> voltage regulator failure because spare parts radiate a force field of some sort. I've never quite figured out the physics of it. But if you have a spare, it's really good protection against the, the primary failing. You know, it, it seems to work out that way. I love that. That is that is exactly what I've experienced. Yeah. <laughs> and but, it saves but, you, you know, on the labor. In the, 310, in the 310, I don't carry spare regulators because I've never had a regulator failure. But I had lots of vacuum pump failures, so I, so I carry <laughs> spare vacuum pump. But, but again, you, you get to save the labor. You keep the part. You never have to worry about using it because you have it. And then <laughs> you don't have to deal with the labor of installation. I know my kit... It's funny, I was chuckling as you were saying that because that's exactly what's in my kit. I've got a voltage regulator, I've got a vacuum pump, I've got the vacuum pump wrench, which is bent in a way that it never fits nicely into any case. Um, uh, uh, and uh, and that, that's kind of like what I do. Although there's one other thing, which is we got stuck down in Clemson um, uh, visiting, that's where Ben is, and uh, as we landed, the, you know, re had a flat tire and you would think, oh yeah, you can always find your way into getting a new tube. No way. And yeah, to, but yeah, you that's, know, the, that's the, one. the one blessing is, is FedEx overnight. You, you can generally get them overnighted, you know, you call Desser, uh, <clears> whichever <throat> coast you're closest to, and you can usually get the thing the next day. Yes, as but we're usually all traveling. Unless it's a three-day weekend. A three-day weekend. That's exactly when we were traveling. So, and that's a, that's a, that's when the failures always happen. They know about these things, you know. It's... <laughs> so, so what? So supplies. Let's see. So maybe keep a tube, a spark plug. What else would you? Yeah, I, I carry a couple spark plugs and a spark plug socket. That's another one you can't pick up at Ace Hardware, you know. So it's always good to carry stuff like that. I carry a a spare. Landing light bulb and a spare taxi light bulb, because um, I've been too much of a cheapskate to change those out for LEDs. Um, but I do have LED position lights and stuff, so I don't have to carry spares of those anymore. Um, Makes sense. But you know, it, it's it. In my experience, it's very um, airplane specific. Right. You own an airplane for a while. You, you you get a sense of of what sort of things fail on a regular basis and, and what sort of things are really reliable and so it's a good idea to carry the stuff that fails it, that assuming it's, assuming it's not too bulky or too heavy i mean there's some things like i'm not going to carry like a spare battery <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that but um uh, I know I don't know if there's something similar in in in, in uh, Cessnas like yours. I know I know in the Bonanzas you also keep a spare tow pin because those will snap if someone tries to tow uh, your plane. Yeah, and they yeah. Tow it and they'll snap it right off. Yeah, but it is it is it is very airplane specific, and if you've owned the airplane for a while, you sort of get a sense of what sorts of things you really want to carry spares of. What about the idea of bringing either electronically or physically um, some form of manuals that would help you or a mechanic? Absolutely. Um, I I have um, 
a maintenance manual and an, and an illustrated parts catalog for my aircraft, uh, both on a on a CD-ROM that I that that is in the in one of the seat pockets, seat back pockets, and it's also on on my laptop, which I basically carry with me everywhere I go. So, um, I you know I wouldn't particularly favor carrying around paper manuals because they're because they're bulky. Um, yeah. But um, nowadays, most you, you can get most of the manuals in electronic form, and yep, uh, that makes a lot of sense. One thing that's also come up is uh, some information as to what would for 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 anyone. Well, I think it, it, I was going to say with retractable gear aircraft, but realistically, it could be with any type of aircraft. But having access readily available to um, if there's a collapse of any kind and you're stuck on a runway to make sure that you can defend your airplane and that and instruct people on how to properly get it taken care of with so much damage it seems is done after the fact whenever there's an incident on a runway that's absolutely correct that we, we we tend to see a lot more damage done in the in the recovery process than we do in the actual accident and uh, aircraft owners have to be very uh, assertive, I guess is the right word. Uh, I had I had this happen to me, it was less than a year ago. Um, I actually wrote about it in AOPA uh, Pilot Magazine, but uh, I had a, a tire blowout going into, into um, uh, I'm trying to remember, a Hawthorne Airport down in uh, Southern California. Um, it's a single runway, very, very busy towered airport. It's the closest airport to LAX, closest GA airport to LAX. And somehow or other, um, I blew a right main tire and the airplane um, went off the side of the runway. I, it was, I didn't have directional control. Um, and it, it went off in, into the, what looked like it was going to be the grass, except it turned out to be green painted asphalt, <laughs> rough green painted asphalt. Um, and it shut down the airport because it was, even though it was off the runway, it was too close to the runway for the tower to be able to authorize any operations. They have some some minimum distance off the runway that, that the aircraft have to be before they can authorize somebody to land or take off. So I basically shut down this really busy airport. And so, of course, vehicles immediately descended on my airplane with all sorts of cockamamie ideas about how they were going to get this airplane far enough away from the runway that they could reopen the airport. and. A lot of these cockamamie ideas would have would have, you know, torn off the gear doors or done all sorts of stuff. And so I know I was just sitting there saying, "No, you're not going to do that," you know. And finally, uh, 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 an experienced IA who just happened to be working that day—I think it was a Saturday—and I don't know why he was at work that day, but he came over and we had a conversation and uh finally came up with an idea that we both agreed would probably work and and we we, we were able to do it that lift the airplane enough to, to to remove the the blown tire and then put the axle on a dolly and and move the airplane it took some creativity but um but i i basically had to fend off all these people who had you know who whose priority was to get my airplane away from the runway it was their priority was not to to leave my airplane undamaged <laughs> and so you know that's the it was an interesting experience um but um it was a good thing that i was as assertive as i was because we were able to get the airplane moved and get it fixed up and i was out of there a couple of days later that's really, really important. Um, and, and so, I mean, the idea that that you can that you know you don't have to go along with what people are saying, even if they're you know they're there with you know uniforms that make it look like you have to do whatever they say. Um, you need to know what's okay, 
and where the jack points are on your airplane, how to properly do it or how to properly hoist it if that's really required um, to protect yourself from further damage. Yeah, what, and we we tried, we, we, we found some jacks, and, and but it, they, they wouldn't work. It, the, if, the, if the jack was short enough to fit under this wing that was on a, a, a flat, a collapsed tire, so the wing was lower than usual, then it wouldn't extend high enough to 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 get the thing off the ground mm. because it it didn't have enough throw to fully extend the oleo strut, which was still oleoing just fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so it 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 took some real ingenuity to figure out how to how to get it jacked up. We we wound up putting a piece of the, the of uh, tubing through a hollow part portion of the axle. And then using a a, a a bottle jack to jack up the air, the airplane from using that tube until we could get the tire off and get the the axle set down on a dolly. It was it was an interesting experience. That makes it a was, lot. Of... It, it was probably an hour and a half before we were finally able to get the airplane moved. Wow. So, you know, one of the things that that brings up is that when you think about what to put in your toolkit. Uh, any aircraft that require adapters for jacking mm -hmm. should be adapters that you bring with you. And yeah, I I, I had a, a, a the the wheels on my airplane are secured using a a, a very non-standard fastener that requires a, a very special spanner, and I always carry one of those in my in my toolkit so fortunately i had one with me otherwise we would have had another problem <laughs> um, that makes a lot of sense as well let's let's uh talk about we mean when you mentioned defending your aircraft that's that's a big part uh, of a lot of your education uh, that you give people on what you know how to keep yourself from being kind of how to get help and then how to keep yourself from being held hostage by what someone wants to or doesn't want to release yeah. of your aircraft. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that. Um, well, I'm not sure I understand the context of your question, Jeff. So the the, the first thing is, um, well, let's actually talk about your service with, with Savvy Breakdown, um, because you actually allow people, make it possible for people to, to make a one-stop call, whether they just got stranded on the runway or whether they're actually you know just broken down somewhere and need some help in even where to go tell me about that service yeah well we you know we started we started savvy breakdown about i think about five years ago now um and the reason we started it is i couldn't believe that nobody was doing it, <laughs> it you know it, it, it i every category of owner operated motor vehicles whether it's cars it's rvs it's it's snowmobiles it's boats every category of of owner operated uh, motor vehicles have have a breakdown service except for airplanes i couldn't believe that nobody did it so i looked into it and you know it turns out it's not as easy as it is for other kinds of vehicles for there, there are two reasons first of all aviation is very highly regulated and second of all, um, it's normally not possible to tow an airplane the way it is a car, an RV, a boat, or whatever. You, you usually have to fix it wherever it's stuck. So those two things make it more challenging, which I guess is why nobody was doing it. But you know, we'd been offering breakdown assistance to our managed maintenance clients for years, and we, we thought, well, we know how to do this. So we decided to, to to offer that service a la carte, and, and we offer it for like 90 bu 99 bucks a year for, for a single engine airplane, which is sort of, you know, comparable to what you pay for AAA for your car. Mm -hmm. um, and when somebody calls the hotline, that they get a call back from one of our IAs. Uh, our, it's guaranteed within 15 minutes, and usually it's more like five minutes. It's usually pretty quick. Um, some one of one of our staff is is always on on call um, on a twenty four seven basis, 
And the first thing we do is ask a lot of questions because we're trying to gather data on exactly what happened. And, um, and, and we're trying to diagnose the problem, which we're almost always can do um, over the phone. Occasionally, if it's something really complicated, we'll ask the owner maybe to, to dump some engine monitor data and send it to us. But usually we can kind of figure it out just by by, by asking the owner a bunch of questions, maybe asking him to try some stuff and tell us what the result is. Um, and then once, once we've diagnosed the problem, the next thing we do is try to figure out whether, it's, whether it constitutes a safety of flight issue or not. And it turns out about 50% of the time, it's not a safety of flight issue. It's, it, hmm. it's, a, it's a bad sensor. It's something that you can live with until you get home. And the other half of the time, it's something that has to get it has to get resolved. Um, so we um, we'll do whatever it takes to get it resolved, and and we'll give the owner the option to either stay with his airplane until it's resolved, or to find alternate transportation, continue his trip, and know that we're dealing with his airplane problems while he's while he's away. Um, so they're basically, it's kind of a version of your managed maintenance. So basically you're helping diagnose the, the it's situation. Very, very short term managed maintenance, yes. Yeah, you're finding someone local or, or that can get there to uh, to do it. You're, you're, if, you're I mean, if that's necessary. Parts. A lot of the time we can talk the owner through, through um, first of all, like I say, half the time it turns out to be something that isn't really a, safety of flight item and can and you know you can live with until you get get back home or get to a more suitable place where you you want to have the maintenance done um and a lot of the time we can talk the owner through through a, a repair or at least a temporary repair um because we always it, it's always better to to deal with problems at home than it is to deal with them on the road so if there's if there's a way to to do that, we'll always do that. I mean, a classic example, w w which illustrates it very well, is was a, a Cirrus SR22 client of ours who, um, I think he was at he had a problem at Tallahassee. He went to Tallahassee for a business meeting, and when he came back to the airplane, he couldn't get the engine started. And he, and he called the hotline and we asked him some questions to describe the symptoms. And he basically said, well, you know, I can, when I, when I turn the key to the start position, I, I, I can hear the starter motor turning and the prop twitch is just a little bit, but it won't, you know, turn over. So he said, well, it's a starter adapter problem. And he said, oh, okay, well, there, there's, there's a Cirrus authorized service center here on the field. I guess I'll have them change the starter adapter. We said, no, you don't want to do that. First of all, changing the starter adapter is, is, is a four to six hour job. But we happen to know that Continental starter adapters were, were, were back ordered about six weeks. So if he took the airplane to the shop, he was going to, his airplane's going to be stuck there for six weeks. And we said, no, don't, don't, don't call us the Cirrus Service Center. Don't pull, put the airplane there. Call the FBO and have them bring out a ground power unit because we know from experience that if you, if you have a, a, a slipping starter adapter that you can usually get another three or four starts out of it if you power the airplane with 28 volt ground power rather than 24 volt battery power. So he got the FBO to bring out their cart and you know, 15 minutes later, he had the engine running and he flew home and, and then he dealt with it at home. We always like to get the aircraft owner home with the minimum amount of work possible. In this case, we didn't have to do any maintenance. We just had to come up with a, a battlefield technique to, to, to get him back home, which is, oh, and it, it happened to be he was going home for Thanksgiving dinner. So, you know, it was even more <laughs> important to, to do that. that makes sense. But, and like you said, it's anyway, not a safety of flight issue. Either your engine's yeah. running or it's not. The, the, you know, the thing is, if you, if, if you put your airplane in a maintenance shop, they are totally focused 
on fixing the airplane. We're, we don't focus on fixing the airplane. We focus on getting, getting the owner to where he wants to go or getting the owner home. Um, and we, we will do only as much maintenance as is absolutely necessary to accomplish that goal. Because doing maintenance on the road is, is a, a very uncomfortable thing. And it frequently involves being stuck somewhere you don't want to be for some indeterminate time. And um, you're dealing with people you don't really know whether to trust or not. It's just a terribly uncomfortable situation. So, so our, our, our focus is, it's, we, we call it owner first, airplane second. We're, we're focused on the owners, solving the owner's problem, not solving the airplane's problem. We'll solve uh -huh. the airplane's problem only to the extent necessary to solve the owner's problem. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, when you talk about advocacy, which is such a big part of all the things that you've written about the rights of the aircraft owner and how to know your rights and how to exercise your rights, how what kind of advice can you give owners that that are, you know, assuming that they don't happen to have your service like everybody should um, and they're stuck away from home and someone is basically saying, no, that's not airworthy. I'm not letting you, or I don't think, or, or I found some other problem. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on how do you, what do you tell someone to kind of arm people with understanding their rights a little bit more? Okay. Well, well first of all, it's very important to understand that, that no mechanic has the authority to ground your airplane. There are there are people who have that authority. They're, they're, they're called airworthiness safety inspectors, and they work for the FAA and the FISTO. And, and an airworthiness safety inspector does have the right to hang a condition notice on your airplane and say, you can't fly this airplane until whatever condition is listed on the notice has been fixed. No mechanic has, has that right. No mechanic has the right to ground an airplane. Um, now, you know, FAR 91.7 says, basically, you're not allowed to fly an airplane that's not airworthy. And there's an exception to 91.7. The exception is if you have a ferry permit. Ferry permits are special dispensation from the FAA to fly an unairworthy airplane. But the normal rule is, is the airplane has to be, unair, has to be airworthy. Mm -hmm. but, but who makes a determination whether an airplane is airworthy? Well, once a year, you're required to hire an IA to make that determination. 364 days a year, it's the pilot in command that makes that determination. So if you put your airplane in the shop for anything other than an annual inspection or 100 hour inspection, most of us don't have to do those. Um, it's not the shop's business to tell you whether the airplane's airworthy. It's only the shop's business to, to make the repairs that you ask them to make. Mm -hmm. And when they sign off a logbook entry for those repairs, that signature isn't saying the airplane is airworthy. It's only saying that the work that they did was done properly. That's all the signature means. Mm -hmm. The only signature in a logbook that says that the airplane is airworthy is the one the IA makes when he signs off an annual inspection. You know, the classic example that I always use when I'm doing um, IA renewal seminars is I said, uh, okay, so uh, so uh, an aircraft owner brings his, his, his Cessna 182 into your shop and you walk around the airplane and you notice two things about the airplane. One is that the right main tire is flat and the other is that the left wing is missing. <laughs> And the owner says, would you please change the flat tire? So what do you do? You change the flat tire. You make a logbook entry saying, I changed the tire with, you know, I installed a, 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 a Michelin 6006 four-ply tire uh, and a tube and all that stuff. And, and you sign it off. Your signature doesn't mean, and, and then you say to the owner, by the way, your airplane's ready, the tires changed, but oh, by the way, I couldn't help but notice that the left wing is missing. So 
if I were you, I probably wouldn't fly the airplane in this condition, but it would be only, you know, a helpful, friendly suggestion. It's not the mechanic's business that the left wing is, is missing, okay? You only asked him to, re to replace the, the, the right main tire, and he did that. And he signed off his logbook entry saying, I did that. I did it satisfactorily. Now, I, I wouldn't advise trying to get the annual inspection signed off on that airplane without the left wing, because that's a whole different ballgame. Once a year, an IA has to make an error with his determination. If he sees the left wing missing, he's going to say, hey, by the way, I'm not going to be able to sign off this annual as airworthy. I'll be, be glad to do the annual, and I'll sign it off with a discrepancy list and give you a discrepancy list with one item on it saying there's no left wing on this airplane. Um, but I can't sign off the annual as airworthy. But in any other context other than an annual inspection, it's, it's, you're, you're not asking the mechanic to make any sort of airworthiness determination. That's not his job. His job is to do what you tell him to do. Tell him to change the flat tire. He can change the flat tire and sign it off. And if any mechanic says I can't sign, I can't sign off, you know, this logbook entry because there's no left wing, that's wrong. That's totally ridiculous. Right. Do you, do you find that that is something that you run into during your uh, savvy breakdown surfaces and when you're trying to advocate for people, obviously uh, not in the extreme cases of missing a left wing, but <laughs> other things that I have. I use that heard, case just because yes. it's, you know. It <laughs> but is. I mean, I've heard, I've heard things where people have done the tire, you know, hey, I, I, I need it. I need the tire, I need the tube replaced. And the, and the, the shop's like, well, you know, I, I think this tire is too worn and um, I, we don't have any other tires, so I'm not going to do the tube or, or I'm not going to sign it off. Or I think the brake disc is below minimums or your pads are below minimums or I don't like the way the strut looks or whatever. Um, do you have, have issues? That well, you not, not, that? Yeah, now you're getting into a very interesting area. Um, it, let's, let's take the case that you talked about where, where you're asking a mechanic to, to replace the tube. In order to replace the tube, he has to remove the tire. There isn't any way to, to, to replace the tube without removing the tire. And if he feels that the tire is in unairworthy condition, and by the way, a tire isn't unairworthy in, un, unless it's worn to the point that cord is showing. Mm -hmm. you look that right up in, in, the, in the Goodyear um, tire maintenance manual, and it, it says it very specifically. Um, but if, if he finds the tire is unairworthy, he, you know, he can't really reinstall an unairworthy tire on the airplane because part of what you're asking him to do involves the tire, even though you want the tube replaced. Right. And the, the, the same thing may be, may be true of, of, uh, of the, the brake linings, if, if, if he has to take the brakes apart in order to get the wheel off, in order to change the tube, which is generally the case, um, then he can't really put unairworthy brake linings back on your airplane be, because, he, he, because part of what you asked him to do involved taking them off. Right. But you know, if there's a huge dent in the wing, that has nothing to do with what you asked him to do. So it's, mm -hmm. it, um, that, you know, if, 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 if he brings up the dent in the wing, then he's basically on a fishing expedition. And, and uh, annual inspections are, are you, you are authorizing an, a fishing expedition when you bring an airplane in for an annual inspection. That's what an annual inspection is. It's a fishing expedition. But Normal maintenance is not supposed to be a fishing expedition. They're supposed right. to fix what you asked. But again, in the case of the, the, the tire stuff we were talking about, there's you, you can't just replace a tube. You've got to take a bunch of stuff apart in order to replace the tube. And the stuff you took apart really has to be in airworthy condition before the mechanic can put it back together. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and it does. I mean, if you put yourself in the position of the mechanic, that that makes perfect sense. 
Let's let's talk about an area that is uh, certainly has has a fair amount of gray around it, and and that's why I want to kind of understand what your thoughts are. Um, one of the biggest things that seems to happen when people are traveling are is leaks, um, and the and sometimes it, maybe it was something that was already there. Sometimes it becomes uh, you know different. If you're talking about um, fuel, if you're talking about oil, how do you help guide people about what's acceptable and what isn't? What research resources should people go to to figure that out, to help advocate, to get themselves back to where they want to be for their maintenance? Um, well, like for fuel leaks, for example, there, there's there's very specific guidance in, in, in uh, the Mechanics Bible AC 4313-1B which classifies fuel leaks into four or five different categories. Um, uh, there are, uh, what are they, slow seeps, seeps, Seep, stains, I, I, I forgot, but running, anyway, I think running leaks, running, running leak, <laughs> and, and the worst category is a running leak. Um, and a, a, a running leak is always considered to be on air, a uh, fuel leak. It's always considered to be an airworthy. You can't have a running leak, but a run, but nobody you wouldn't fly an airplane with a running leak anyway. It'd be just be, be crazy, which which basically means, um, you know the, the if 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 you have a leak and you wipe it clean and it doesn't come back immediately then that's slow enough that that it's not an airworthy condition it's not not to say that it shouldn't be fixed right it's just to say that you could fly it to wherever you want to to get it fixed including going home um if you have separate tanks can you usually get a ferry permit or is it required a ferry permit then to fly off of uh, one tank to get where you need to go well i don't think you need a ferry permit for that i mean for example if you have aux tanks and they're leaking um, and and you decide that you're gonna fly home and not put fuel in the aux tank that's leaking that that doesn't require a ferry permit you just fly home even if it's a left or right main if you stay on one tank and do something like that that's that doesn't require a permit I can't see how it would okay um, again if it was a if it's a running leak then 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 it might be it might be an issue um, well, some of these aren't, you know, we think about, it's easy to think about them in terms of like, you know, running leaks like that. I've had it, uh, I've seen that cases where it's actually something more common where like an O-ring and a cap is compl gets completely shot somehow and you just can't fly with fuel in that side until you get that O-ring replaced. And if it's not available locally and you know it's available at your home... <laughs> Yeah, then you may I, choose I wouldn't, to do something I wouldn't hesitate to do that as long as you're not compromising safety in any way. I, I mean, yeah. Um, if the flight home is short enough that you can reasonably make it only fueling the one tank. Um, what about what about oil? What are what do you get calls a lot about? Like, well, I've started to see an oil leak, and how you figure out what that is while there, and how critical an oil leak is during a trip. Yeah, I mean, usually oil leaks are are are, are not rapid leaks. It, it it doesn't take a lot of oil to make a big mess. Um, the only the only really rapid oil leaks that I've seen are typically where somebody forgets to secure the oil filler cap, or alternatively, the 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 quick drain isn't closed and oil is coming out the drain. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen one or two where, uh, like the Cessna 210, um, if you want to put a quick drain on the Cessna 210, it's got to be a special low pro profile quick drain because if you put a standard quick drain in, the, the minute you track the gear, it, it hits the quick drain and opens it. So I've seen a couple of cases like that. <laughs> That's interesting. What about like uh, like uh, the nose seals or something? Any things around that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of other places that oil will leak, and it and it typically leaks very slowly. And, Got and it. So it's it's uh, assuming that it's not making the windshield opaque, then I don't see any reason not to fly home with it. 
I, uh, I, I started to have a prop go, which kind of brings that up, which is interesting where, you know, the seals will go, as you mentioned, gradually on a prop starts putting, you know, little dots on your windshield mm -hmm. and, and uh, a, um, uh, both uh, IA and also a wonderful uh, FAA in inspector, Benny Britt, that, uh, that got me my IA when I asked him about it, because I was asking him about it when I was on a trip and I was about six hours from home, he, that's what he said. He said, can you still see through the windshield? Yeah, exactly. I said, I said yeah. He's like, then I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a propeller that was that was throwing a little bit of oil in, and, I, and I, I, I flew over to a prop shop and he inspected everything and so, and he said, he said, you want to know my advice? And I said, sure. He said, carry a rag, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. He didn't, want, he didn't want to take the prop apart. He didn't think it was serious <clears throat> enough to do that. So that, he's, that my, he's my kind of prop guy. <laughs> so one other area as we get to, you know closer to the top of the hour here is, uh, you know, having people be familiar with what is required equipment on their aircraft and what their ability is to mark things inoperative. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. And, and I also have another article that I wrote. I, I, think, it, I think it was probably one that was an AOPA pilot, but it's, it's, you, can, you can Google it because it's, it's on, on, I have all these articles on the website, <laughs> hundreds of them. I was going to say, there isn't a topic was, that's going to show up, Mike, that you haven't right. written an article. And it, the, the title of the article was, is my airplane too broken to fly? And it, and it talked all about the, the subject that you're talking about, which is is, is 91.413D for, for, for regulation wonks, um, which, uh, which talks about uh, um, inoperative equipment, uh, inoperative uh, equipment. And, and, and it's a very complicated regulation. Um, but but it it if if something is inoperative um, on 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 big airplanes um, the the airplane has what's called a minimum equipment list which basically spells out for you exactly what what you what equipment can and cannot be inoperative. But for little airplanes like ours, the, the FAA doesn't have the manpower to generate MELs for all of us. So they, they, they finally came out with this thing called 91213D, which is sort of a, a generic set of rules for little airplanes as to what, what we're allowed to, to, to fly with in operative and, and, and what we can't. And, and there's there's a series of tests in the regulation. I don't have it in front of me because I didn't know you were going to ask me this question. <laughs> but yeah, basically, um, the, the first question is is it is it on the list of required equipment for the aircraft, which which came from, comes from the manufacturer. Um, then the next question is is it required by by any of the Part 91 regulations, uh, you know, there, there's regs that say for day VFR flight, here's what you have to have, and for night VFR flight, here's what you have to have, and for day IFR and so on. So the next question is, is, is the equipment required by one of those Part 91 regulations? Um, and then the, the um, if it's not required by if it's not required equipment and actually if if you're flying a part 23 airplane like a cirrus or something that then the poh has something called a koel kinds of equipment which is which is a, a little more sophisticated version of the required equipment list so it it, it has to the equipment has to not be required or or, or required by the koel and not required by part 91 and the third is that you have to make a determination that that flying with the inoperative equipment doesn't constitute a hazard to safety, which is a subjective standard that the pilot command has to make that judgment. And if it passes all of those tests, then you're allowed to, 
to, to fly with it inoperative by either removing the equipment from the airplane or by disabling it and, and placarding it as inoperative. And frequently disabling it basically means pulling the circuit breaker. Uh, if it's, you know, if it's avionics or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a, it, it is a very complex regulation. It's, it's a, it's one of the longest regulations, I think, in, in part 91, um, because it goes through all of these different tests that you have to perform. That makes sense. And, and for the things when you can't do it, when you can't get past things by placarding and understanding required equipment, uh, and you do require a ferry permit, I think it's important to clarify for people because we've had some questions that, um, that that's not something an owner themselves does. That's something that you have to get done by a, uh, by a mechanic. What is, what is a, a, a ferry permit if that is required? Oh, the ferry permit. Well, a ferry permit actually, um, the, the an owner can apply for a ferry permit. Mm -hmm. um, it's really the the applicant of the ferry permit is almost always the owner. Mm -hmm. But um, but in order to get a ferry permit, the the typical way of doing it is to get an A and P mechanic to make a logbook entry that says that that he's inspected the airplane and it's safe to make the proposed ferry flight. Now that's a very low standard. It, it, it's not saying that it's airworthy. Obviously, if the airplane was airworthy, you wouldn't need a ferry permit. So <laughs> the airplane is admittedly unairworthy, otherwise you wouldn't be applying for the ferry permit. But basically what the mechanic is 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 being asked to to say in the logbook entry is that he, he has determined that the airplane is safe to make the 30 minute flight or whatever flight you're trying to make. Um, now, you don't, that's not a requirement to have, to have a safe to fly logbook entry. But if you don't have one, it means an FAA inspector is gonna have to come out and look at your airplane. Now you don't want that <laughs> because an FAA inspector has the, has, has, is the guy that has the right to hang a condition notice on your airplane. So you'd never want an FAA inspector looking at yes. your airplane if you they're, can help. They're also, they're also the least likely people to actually go along with whatever is and sign their well, name. I, I, say, and the other, the other thing is that, that with, the, with the staffing problems that the FAA has, it's, it's likely to be three weeks from next Sunday before the inspector can come out and look at your airplane. So, so for practically speaking, you always want to get a safety ferry uh, a logbook entry from from a from an A and P, preferably a, a very friendly A and P. <laughs> Absolutely. And and if you have one of those, then usually it's a piece of cake to get to 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 get the ferry permit. And and typically, it used it used to be that you that you fill out a form called eighty one thirty dash six. Um, which is actually the, a big long form that's, that's an application for an airworthiness certificate, but you only fill out a couple of sections of it when you want a ferry permit and you leave the rest of it blank. And it used to be we'd fax it to the FAA and they'd fax us back the ferry permit, but nowadays you mostly email it to them and they email you back the ferry permit. And it's, it's not uncommon to get a firm ferry permit turned around the same day. That, and getting anything done in the same day is all is good news. So speaking yeah. of response time, as we come to the top of the hour, tell us again about Savvy's breakdown service and um, and how people can can take part in this. Because I'll tell you, for ninety nine dollars to have someone that you can call, it's it, it I can't imagine a better deal. Yeah, I think it's kind of a no brainer too. We actually we actually reduced the price on it. It was originally one hundred and fifty dollars, and we. It for a couple of years and said, "Hey, you know, I think we can cut the price on it. It's the only only price we've ever cut is breakdown assistance." Um, sure, but, because uh, once someone experiences what they get on the other end of managed service just for their breakdown, they're going to sign up and uh, and have the managed service because it's so good. Yeah, well, if, if anybody who's who's signed up for for uh, our either our savvy MX ma managed maintenance or the savvy QA consulting service that they get breakdown assistance as, as part of that. They want to pay extra for it. It's, it's kind of packaged in, but 
if you just want to buy the breakdown service a la carte, it's $99 uh, a year for, for a, a single engine piston aircraft. Um, and um, if, if you go to the SavvyAviation.com website, uh, you can read about it there and you can sign up for it there. Uh, the, the sign up is online and you're just immediately enrolled in it. Awesome. Well, thank Mike, you. thank you so, again for taking time out of your evening and joining us here for another uh, another wonderful episode of education here on Social Flight Live. I really appreciate it. I hope you'll come back and join us with course. another topic in well, the future. We, these are always a lot of fun, Jeff, so I'm happy to come back. That's great. And for anyone out there, be sure to check out Mike's article, all of his articles in AOPA, but especially when it comes to breakdown and advocating for yourself, take a look at the most recent AOPA article that he wrote on how to get uh, rescued and get those services when you're away from home. So Mike, yeah, thank that, you again. That article was just was kind of a, a like a half a dozen real life war stories of things that have happened to to, to our clients when they were on trips and and, and how we dealt with them and um, it sort of emphasized the you know our three basic rules of of, of uh, are one. Um, uh, don't do don't do maintenance away from home if you can possibly avoid it. Two is is uh, if you if you can't avoid it, do as little maintenance as possible, and that often means making some sort of a battlefield repair that's good enough to get you home, and and then doing a more legitimate repair. Um, and you know the third rule is don't do anything until you've diagnosed the problem, because you know you, again if you take the airplane to a mechanic. They'll, they'll probably attack it with tools. And we, we don't like people attacking airplanes with tools until we're pretty sure we know what's wrong. Yeah. So that's why, you know, we, we always start off with, you know, with, with a, a session of questions and answers to try to figure out exactly what's wrong with the airplane before we, we do anything else. And like I say, half the time uh, that we do that, it turns out that the problem is one that doesn't represent a safety of flight issue. And um, you know, we'll, we'll tell the owner it's okay to fly home like that, and he says, "Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the best news I've had all day." And that, I mean, that's that's always the best outcome for anybody is just just to not have to do anything away from home. That makes well. a lot of sense. And the other thing I'll encourage people to do is, of course, sign up with you, even if they're not yet uh, doing a service, because on your email list you come out every once in a while with an article. Uh, about you know what's what's going to happen, the kind of good story that's come out of Savvy, and I find those incredibly educational. Yeah, we're going to be doing we're going to be doing more of those going forward. Excellent. Well, thanks so much again for taking time out of your busy evening and joining us here on Social Flight Live. Have a oh, wonderful you bet, night. You bet, Jeff. Thanks a lot. You got it. Take night, care. Good night, everybody. And to all of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be back next Tuesday, November 1st, with United States Air Force Thunderbirds former pilot Caroline Jensen. Uh, it's just a, she is a remarkable person, and it's going to be a great show hearing about her story and what she's got going on. On the following Tuesday, Tuesday, November 8th, Kenneth Katz is here with his book that he's come out with that's wonderful about the B-1 bone, the bomber, the whole story behind this aircraft from a technology standpoint, a development standpoint, a political standpoint. And uh, it is, I'll tell you, that book is just fascinating. And uh, it'll be a really great evening to talk with Ken about that and learn about the story of putting the book together. On Tuesday, November 15th, the incomparable Corky Fornoff will be here on the show. And if you can remember seeing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the amazing BD jet fly uh, in uh, the BD-5 jet fly in, in the James Bond movies, that was Corky flying that. And he really set the stage for so many others that have followed when it comes to aerial coordination for movies and stunt flying. And so it's going to be a wonderful evening with Corky. And then on the 22nd, U Avionics is here with Shane Woodson. And uh, we're going to get to see some really, really cool things going on with them. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And I wish you all blue skies.